evolved to acquire vast stretches of our behavioral repertoire, ideas, beliefs, and values uh, from other members of our social group. So for very basic things like how to find food or build shelters or make tools, humans are reliant on learning from other creatures in, in, in a way that we don't find in other species. And rather than setting up a dichotomy between culture on the one hand and, and genes on the other, what we try to do is apply the logic of natural selection to think about human learning. So how would our capacity for culture, our ability to learn from others, have evolved in adaptive ways that allow us to most effectively extract adaptive ideas, beliefs, and values from our social milieu? So once you have that idea, you can begin to theorize, well, what kinds of things should people pay attention to? What content should be particularly attractive to them? Who in their social milieu should be particularly important for learning from? So we know, for example, that young children will key in on information about dangerous animals, and they'll readily acquire, and this will stick in their heads, and they'll remember which animals are dangerous and which are not. More so That's, than algebra. Exactly, that, yeah. exactly. So there's a bias in what they remember, what's salient to them. Uh, and we can get to this through the application of natural selectionist thinking and thinking about how our minds might have been shaped. And we find this in different societies. But by the same token, we also are selective about who we attend to. So looking, for learning from more prestigious people, learning from more successful people, competent people, uh, using cues like same sex or same uh, ethnicity or dialect to help learn those things that are most likely to be adaptive or useful to you later in life. So you can think of humans as adaptive of learners. So now everything becomes an evolutionary explanation, it's, and any given explanation may involve some amount of learning from other people, mm -hmm. and then that's a, that's a cultural input. In it. And so we know that culture affects large uh, swaths of human psychology and decision making, but it's got to be intermixed with what we know about sort of basic psychological processes, basic aspects of cognition. Right, great. So how would you apply this to religion, explaining religious behavior and belief? Yeah, so what my, what my colleagues and I have done is to say, you know, humans have some basic psychological processes, like our ability to represent other minds. Um, and our, the fact that we tend to think dualistically, that we can separate the mind and the body, even though minds and bodies can actually be separated. And this, this gives some basic tools for cultural evolution to work with. And one of the forces of cultural evolution that I'm most interested in is intergroup competition. And so we can then favor certain kinds of uh, supernatural agents that allow groups to succeed in, in intergroup competition, that make, mem make a social group more cohesive, more cooperative, enforce internal harmony. And this is going to favor supernatural agents agents which can do those things. And this might be an agent that has the power to punish and monitor and make sure that people obey the local norms even when they don't have to and they're outside the monitoring eyes of other members of their community. Okay. It also might favor rituals that help build solidarity among social groups. So this is, this is taking the basic ingredients that are supplied by our evolved aspects of our cognition, but then building on it and rejiggering it in ways that lead uh, to group benefits. How does the building and rejiggering happen? So there's not, is there an evil genius who's thinking what's the best way to in design a religion so that we can cooperate better? What are the mechanisms yeah, that you'd so propose? I think that one uh, interesting way to approach that is to look at actual cases. In Papua New Guinea, there's this uh, region of Papua New Guinea called the Sepik region, and their villages typically don't grow above 300 people. And anthropologists in the 1950s and 60s were puzzled by how come they couldn't scale up beyond 300 people. And then they discovered one village that had 500 people. So an anthropologist named Donald Tuzin went to that village. And this is particularly interesting because this is a region of endemic warfare, where your ability to win fights and battles depends on how many soldiers or how many men you can put on the battlefield. So. Strangely, these other communities couldn't scale up, but this one had figured out. And what had happened is this group had copied the ritual and economic, uh, integrated ritual and economic and religious beliefs of a very successful group. But in the course of copying them, they made some modifications or twists by mistake. They, these were errors in the transmission process that made the ritual system even better and uh, had a belief system that had supernatural punishment and had gods that were bigger and gods of the village rather than just of the small clan. And and this allowed this group to scale up uh, and, and then succeed at, at where the other groups didn't. So this mistaken copying would be an analog to mutations in exactly, genetic evolution. Exactly. So it's a random and, change that then right. has adaptive And benefits. there's a selective process because they learned this stuff from a group that was already successful and then mm -hmm. in the process of transmission it got modified. Okay. And they were trying to copy it exactly because they thought if they could cop get the exact same uh, beneficial effects, then 
uh, they would be able to win, but it turns out they actually got something better. Okay. And so if you step back from this and zoom out, this process is going on all the time. Sometimes when groups copy, they might make a worse copy and then they just disappear in history. But whenever they get something that's a bit better, that can proliferate. <laughs> What's unique about humans is that they're the only species that has cumulative cultural evolution. And what that means is, over generations, one generation figures out some stuff, they pass it on to the next generation who can add, say, new techniques, new aspects to a tool, um, some new food repertoire, and then that all gets transmitted to the next generation. It can accumulate over time so that after a few generations, you have behavioral repertoires, say food processing strategies, tool making strategies, house making strategies, and go on and on. That's more complex than any individual could figure out in their lifetime. And so this means uh, in order to survive as a human, you've got to be willing to accept that we're going to make this tool and there's going to be 27 steps and you're not going to know if step 13 is necessary or unnecessary. So you just have to copy all the steps. So I call this the origin of faith. Humans learn to be able to put faith in cultural practices, even if it violates their own intuitions or their own experience. So you might, for example, um, uh, be willing to follow a detoxification process on, on cassava or uh, some poisonous thing that has to be detoxified through processing. But you yourself have actually never eaten it. You don't even know if it's actually toxic. You just know when we process this food, we do it. And this helps you to survive. And there's lots of cases where when uh, food that needs a lot of detoxification has been transported to other places, people don't adopt this and they get sick and they're not able to re easily reproduce the, the cumulative cultural technology. So this means we can put faith in this body of culturally transmitted knowledge. And this opens the door to putting faith in things like ritual practices and supernatural agents, because as a young learner, you don't really know what's in the world. And even if your intuition say these things might not exist, if everybody else in your community thinks they are and they seem to be successful and whatnot, then you're willing to put some faith in those. And so this, this opens the door to the emergence of religion.